people. So the title of this talk is The First Thing Tacted. And okay, why tack? Um, if any of you have uh, read um, Terry Pratchett's Discworld books, um, tack appears as the original um, in the creation myth of the dwarf race. Um, and so he, there is a sort of a verse um, at the start of that, which is around which this is somewhat structured. Um, but before I get back to that, I should explain uh, how this came about. Um, there's a Python system called Fab, um, which is documented on fabfile.org. It's quite an interesting idea. Um, some guys were talking about it on free node hash put. And it basically does um, SSH to multiple hosts and runs commands on there. And it's been used, it's used quite substantially by sysadmins for ad hoc automation tasks. Um, what it basically provides is the ability to run commands locally and to run them remotely and you have a piece of Python code that's um, controlling all of that. And it's all very well, but that, that struck me as kind of boring. Um, but it has proven very useful to um, system administrators. And I, I was talking around to a few people about um, what tools they use for similar things. Um, they also mentioned um, M Collective, uh, which is short for Marionette Collective, which is produced by the Puppet Guys. And that does a similar thing, but it's message cube app. So you install an M Collective agent on all of your hosts and then you can run um, various forms of commands and requests on a subset of them with that. Um, and basically that ends up running commands. Still boring. So, uh, there's also um, a system called Rex in Perl that um, I wasn't aware of when I first wrote this, which is a little bit more interesting in that it works um, fork-based to handle jobs, but still is limited to the idea of you're going to log in and run some shell stuff. And I was thinking, so what's the general concept um, behind all of this stuff? Basically, messaging of some sort and being able to run tasks. So, step back for a moment and go, well, what, where are we really going with that? What you're really trying to do is run something on a set of systems determined somehow. I mean, okay, massive hand waving there, but that, that's the general idea. Uh, so, if effectively, what you're looking at is um, semi independent agent code um, with a master controller somewhere. Uh, so, I mean, the, the general idea is running code on remote systems, um, not just running commands. But you run into an interesting problem there, which is dependency management. Because if you're trying to run the same command, the same thing on a dozen machines, the reason I think most of them focus on shell commands is because the binaries are all already there. Um, and dependency management for ad hoc code sucks. There's so many times I, I, I come across system administrators going, oh, I'm, I'm not going to use any non-core modules for this script because I don't want to have to ship the modules to 500 servers. And I, I do understand that. Um, so I wrote app fat packer so they were wrong. Um, obviously, obviously, that's the answer. Um, but now you, you still have to you still have to pack each script, and then you still have to copy the script to all of the hosts. So while it's only one file, that that's still quite a lot of messing around. And we're back to me being poor. So I thought, okay, well, just so happens, the pull can do something rather neat here, because pull has the underscore n marker. Now, I, mo people don't really use this very much. I mean, the, 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 the most use I normally see it put to is to say to the parser, you don't need to bother parsing the pod. Just stop now. Um, which is, I suppose, a very nice micro-optimization. But it's not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is N says, the script is done now. And that means that if I SSH to a host and start Perl reading from std in, I can spool the script across to it. When it hits the underscore end, Perl goes, OK, I'm done parsing the script now. And std in is still there and free, so you can still do input and output across std in and std out. 
So you send the script, you send N, and now you can talk to it. But okay, then what? So um, to go back to the original thing, the first thing Tack did, he wrote himself. And that's writing yourself across the wire, right? The second thing Tack did, he wrote the world. Uh, okay, but we need a protocol. Uh, inventing protocols might be very good fun, um, but it's not particularly practical. Uh, at least from at least it's the ultimate yak shape. Um, also, pack and unpack hate me with a fiery, fiery passion. I can never, ever, ever get pack and unpack to do what I want. My, my response to needing to use pack is to ask Leonard or Malcolm and hope that they understand what I wanted. Um, but I, I, I want something simple. Uh, and already exist and that people can um, read on the wire. Because I always think it's important when you're trying to debug a pro uh, protocol problems to be able to see what's going on um, without having to apply some sort of hex on dump or filter or... No. Um, and preferably something that already exists. Uh, so, I mean, what's the default approach to this? Yeah, that's not really a good default approach for small payloads you're going to end up with ten times as much um, guff of HTTP um, as your actual stuff. So that's that not really a good option. What I really want is a, is a library-based protocol. Um, you know, SMTP, IMAP, POP3, all of these things, you can talk to a server just by telnetting to it and typing things. And I, that, that's always a really nice way to check setups. Um, which is fine, but now we're looking at parsing command levels. And I, I still don't, I don't want to have to write a parser. So there's an answer to this, which is JSON. Uh, because JSON has the nice property of um, new lines within strings um, are encoded because it uses double, encode, double quote strings and backslash n. So you can do one JSON object a line. And so you can have a line based system um, along those lines. Um, okay, but we also need this to be able to be reliable. Uh, you, you don't want to be, you, you need to know what the result of the things you asked for is. So you end up with three message types. Um, plain message, which is you know, just a cast, um, as in here is a message, I don't care if you ever reply to it. And then request and response. Okay, but what about actually knowing that the command's still running or getting output as it goes on? So a response fundamentally is the progress of the thing plus the end result. Uh, so I've ended up with four types currently in the basic protocol, which are literally just um, those strings as the first um, element of the JSON array. Um, okay, I, the question of why, why do you have requests at the protocol level? The answer basically is requests need to complete. So code needs to be able to handle the idea of timing out, checking to see if things are still going. So it needs to be baked in at the lowest level. I, I, I figured out several ways that I could ab abstract it so that um, it doesn't need to be at the protocol level, but given everything using that protocol still needs to honor the system, you don't actually gain anything by separating them. Uh, it would basically be generalization for its own sake, which is a great way to write a lot of code that you didn't need. Um, and also, I mean, you need to be able to do tracking. Um, you need to be able to check across multiple hosts which ones are finished, where, where they're all up to. Um, and to be able to time things out at different layers so that if an SSH connection wedges, um, you detect that. If a command goes crazy, you detect that. Um, so, assuming you've got this, now, now you need to figure out message routing. And the common approach in things um, Erlang, STEM, the um, Poe interkernel communication stuff, is that you basically have a central dictionary attached um, to your communication to the outside world. I was thinking, why, why do you actually need that? Why, why do you want to assume that there's only ever going to be one of these systems running in a process, ever? Um, the thing is, if you make the routing opaque, you don't have to do that. All um, routing information is, is some path that will result in it being delivered to the right place. So you attach a, a name to the service, but that name only needs to be attached to 
um, the port that you're actually communicating across. It doesn't need to be global. Um, another port could have some uh, could have a completely different set of services available. Um, and, and the idea of a service name that's actually handled by a service type that's called a router, um, which is a very simple thing. It's basically a bunch of code wrapped around a hash, and so. You're, you're, you're literally just looking at look up the name in the um, hash and then proxy the message onwards. Um, obviously, the actual code has checks to see if it's there and sends back an error if it isn't. But it's still the moral equivalent of that with um, you know slightly more reliability. Um, and then you're sort of going okay, but you need to be able to manage this somehow. So you need a meta service. Um, the idea of a meta service is that's a service that exists to manage what's available on a router. So you can send a message saying, please register under this name an instance of this class and then provide constructor arguments. Which is great, but you're... And then you have a client object um, that basically wraps around dealing with all of this. So you can provide a do method that's synchronous, that blocks the process while it's running and either returns the result or throws the error if it fails. Um, that's implemented in terms of having a result object uh, that you can ask for and then that provides a method that will get the data and throw if there's an error and will give you the exception. So you, you can then do basically if my dollar e equals dollar result exception handle error and if not, go get on it. Um, and then, if you're trying to do things completely asynchronous, then you invoke a request object and provide callbacks on setup. The reason for providing the callbacks on, immediately on setup is that if the thing completes quickly enough, you might never actually have another chance to register things. So they have to be provided up front. Um, and then we just provide a very simple um, <coughs> thing that will wait for all those to be done. It doesn't return anything. All it does is sits and spins um, the control loop until all of those requests are completed or, or failed. We, that, which gives you a basic thing. So, um, before I go on, uh, we, need, we need a small diversion. <laughs> Event loops. Event <laughs> loops are always fun. <laughs> If you've only got one thing to wait for, then just reading off the file handle works beautifully. That's fine. Um, and then you want to do it in parallel, and now you're screwed. <laughs> so, all right, we've, we've got plenty of solutions for this on CPAD. Um, three major ones. Um, but they're all, they're all far more than I need here, because all I'm doing, literally, is waiting for lines of JSON over a socket. I, I, I don't need a full async system in most cases. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I don't want to use any event because that would involve dealing with uh, Mark Lehman. Um, but stealing some of the code from it could work. So I, I went, okay, I'll, um, I'll have a look in um, any event input Perl, which is the simple pure Perl version backing the um, most minimal API possible. And OK, any event in Bill uses select. Great, that's what I was hoping for. Um, and select, I, I don't know how familiar you are with it, because if, if you're not doing sort of low level stuff, it's not something you have to use most of the time. Um, so select, basically, you provide um, vectors containing file handle numbers, and it returns um, vectors saying the, where the bits are set to true or false to indicate whether a file handle is readable or writable. Great, okay. So, you know, your standard way of doing this, and the way um, at least IOA sync select loop works, is to use VAC. It's a Perl built-in function, it's designed for exactly that, it works perfectly. But, this is any event. Oh no! No, 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 no. I, I, I go into the code, and what I find is, we pass the bit mask by first expanding it into a string of zeros and ones. So you now have a string containing zero, one, one, zero, one. Okay, okay, no, 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 that may, maybe that makes sense. And then apply a regular expression to it to what? find the ones. Not even a compiled logic. And now, because as that's going through, 
the match position is moving, it gets the file handle number back out by using pause. Uh, uh, what is this? I don't even... Uh, and so I came to a conclusion. And that was much easier. Uh, anyway, um, so... Having got, the, got this working, we, need, we, we want a nice, a nice simple command line client to work with it. <coughs> so that invokes apt-hack, as is, you know, we, we now have very much a tradition of, if your script is called this, then the code for it lives in app colon colon this. Um, so from Miyagawa, right? Well, in Miyagawa's case, it's app colon colon cpan minus colon colon script. But then he fat packs it, or it into the script as well as because he, he, he wants single file contained, um, which is fair enough. I, I guess, yeah, I'm not worried with polluting the main CPAN namespace, but I guess that's a religious topic that we can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, because the, the module registration system is really comprehensive and useful. Uh, <laughs> Pause it and love it. <laughs> well, I, Brian D. Foy clearly loves it, otherwise he wouldn't have approved Bundle Moose twice. <laughs> Not going that. Anyway, um, but because apptack is just a wrapper which then wants to create an object representing what you're doing with the script, you need the, you need the two-stage thing so that apptack can parse commands that are about its startup and then create the script object that might already have configuration um, and similar applied to it. Um, but you want to be able to, to have custom commands and that, that needs to be easy. So what we actually do is create a class called TACMyScript, which is pretty much an empty subclass of TACScript. And then you have a TAC file on disk which is basically that code is just slurped into the tag my script namespace, um, which then provides your local commands. Um, at which point, you can use minus h to indicate where, um, an SSH location, and command then invokes um, a method. So the, the, the simple one is, if you define um, a routine called each underscore something, um, it will invoke that for each host you've got. Uh, so, okay, uh, what's dollar remote there? Uh, dollar remote is something created through the TAC connector service. Um, the connector service can receive um, a request to connect and then sends back a connection ID, which is basically a name on a router that you can send through. Um, but this is all hidden behind the remote object. Uh, I'm using NetOpenSSH to do it. Nice, simple, wraps the SSH binary already on your system and uses SSH master sockets um, by default so it connects once and if you're repeatedly connecting to the host um, they'll all get multiplexed through a simple connection without me having to write any code for that. Uh, which is always an improvement. Um, we are going to have to implement a version of that that uses NetSSH Perl um, for um, those people running in hell but um, I don't think that's going to be particularly difficult because I'm explicitly only dependent on API parts that SSH Perl provides as well. Um, so you, you, you are pretty much literally able to make a connection just by running an open2. That gives you a read file handle and a write file handle. And then we send to it std in um, a fat script and then end. So, okay. The fat script. That is basically fat pack in um, the not too many dependencies. Uh, the end result is I think it's 45 or 50k, which isn't a horrible thing to be sending over the wire each time. <coughs> yeah. um, and then fat pack file will output the contents of that um, plus the main script itself. Um, and the module for that is Studio Setup, and I, 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 this is literally in a shell script um, that I've got hooked to a make target that I run before release, um, which, generate, which just loads 
stood it out, set up out of the fat pack, um, and then runs it. Um, so once we've got a, meta, a remote running, we do things like ask the meta um, to create a service for us that, we, that we're going to use, because obviously this is currently an empty container. It has no services running except for the meta service. Eh, we have a problem here, because we didn't fat pack the service that we're about to try and build, did we? So, okay, how do we handle that? Well, the far side has a loopback router, uh, which it needs because it needs to be able to send responses to requests, and that, that works through the router system just as much as everything else does. Um, so, what you actually do is on the local side, you attach to your router that the remote connection is going to use um, a service called a module sender. And then on the remote side, you create a module loader. Uh, the expose there is basically passing service references through. So what you're, what you're seeing there is a two-part routing um, expression that's then a client object created and that's provided as a constructor argument. Uh, so that allows you to um, basically connect everything up and still not need that global router concept. Um, so, module sender. Module sender is really simple. It takes a module name, it goes hunting through our ink for it, assuming it finds it, it returns the contents of the .pm file. That's it. Um, handle underscore is the method name signifying this will handle a request synchronously, so don't bother showing me the request object. If I return, then send that as the result. If I throw an exception, send that as an error result. And then the module loader um, has simply some code in it that goes, get that from the sender. What we now have is a string containing the contents of the Perl module. Open a file handle to it and return that. Now we've got a file handle to the Perl module that we got sent from the master host. And then all we have to do is shove that into at ink on the far side. At which point, when the, when the um, remote node tries to load a module that it doesn't already have, it sends a message back to the master, which goes through our ink, pulls the code for it, sends it across the wire, and that then gets loaded normally. Which means you can basically treat as if any pure Perl module that you have installed on the master machine that you're running the tap command on, you can pretend that's already installed on the far side without ever having to um, send anything. <laughs> Which solves the ad hoc dependency problem. So, um, tap command service. Um, this is one of the most basic things. We want to execute um, a system command on the far side. Great, okay. So that basically becomes do command service exec. And then in the command service code, you're, you're, you're literally just looking at um, taking the command, running it. Um, run X is from IPC system simple, because that just saves me a lot of messing about. And then I can return um, the stood out, the stood error, and the exit code. But that's sequential, which is fine. I mean, Fab only works sequentially, but I, I, I want to be able to do things in parallel. Um, so how do we do that? Well, as well as each underscore, you can create a subroutine that's every underscore. If it's called every something, then instead of getting one remote object at a time, you get all of them, at which point you can start them all up front and then sit waiting for the results and do something else after that if you need to. Great, but, you know, okay, well, sometimes you just want to get the results of all of the commands and print them out. But if you're doing something like tailing log files, you need to be able to stream the results as you get it, because your commands aren't going to terminate anytime soon. So you want to be able to supply an on-progress sub optionally for that. But that means you, you need a command line option for it. Um, and your initial command line options were already consumed by that point. So you need to, you, you, where are you going to get the option specification from? I thought, well, yeah, I, I, I could require a bunch of metadata. I could 
create a sort of a fake keyword that's a sub with a prototype or a much simpler approach. Specify, I take an option called stream, and it has a first version, short version called S, and yes, I have done what you think I've done. That's a get up long spec stuffed into the subroutine prototype. <laughs> because the subroutine's already always going to be invoked as a method, so the prototype's always going to be ignored, so I can use it to stash data. Um, because doing it once in Web Simple didn't scare enough people. Um, at which point, we get a dollar options hash ref, and I can just check the hash ref to see if the option was supplied. Which gives you all of the sort of power of get up long. You, you're not having to learn anything else. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep the surface area of learning down because this is designed for um, systems people who aren't heavy developers to be able to use uh, without bursting into tears. Um, <laughs> and at which point, the minus edge option is going to tack script, uh, but because the stream option comes after the exec, that's interpreted as an option to the command itself. So each of your commands can have its own options just embedded in, so, so a single subroutine is a self-contained subcommand. Um, and the short form works because we're using get up long already. Um, okay, that, that, that's great, but we're also going to want to run Perl code for a moment. Now we've got the module loading stuff, it would be rude not to, right? So, tap object service. The, the, the object service was great fun to write. Um, the idea is you create an object client, which is basically a local object that does some bookkeeping. Tell it where the service is, and then you can say, give me a new object on the remote side. Um, now, in order to make this work, we abuse json.pm somewhat. Um, by setting convert blast, um, instead of complaining when it gets an object, it will try and call the two JSON method on it. Which is fine, but we would need to be able to do that for any object. Uh, uh, how do I deal with that? Well, what you do <laughs> is temporarily monkey patch universal <laughs> just for the period of doing the JSON encode. And then, you literally encode it and decode it which gives you back a data structure that you know will collapse to valid JSON that now contains an expression registering which object it is. On the other end, um, you say filter a single key object where the only key is proxy object um, and that can then inflate it on the other side. So the local proxies send method call requests and that gets serialized on the far side it calls the method, and then if that method returns an object, you then get a proxy back again on the local side, which means uh, you can do nice things like invoke path class dear, and then literally the absolute and stringify methods are both sent to the far side. Um, dot, abs dot arrow absolute returns the absolute version, which is a new proxy, and then calls stringify on it. And the proxy object that uses autoload to send any method call, except for destroy. When destroy is fired, it sends a special request saying the local proxy went out of scope. You can destroy the remote object now. Which means, okay, at the cost of we're blocking locally, the remote side does correct object management and things go out of scope at the right time. So the code behaves pretty much exactly how you were hoping it would. Uh, which is great. But now, now we have the thing of, when, when you're experimenting with things, okay, you know, the, 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 st the standard approach for developing code when you're experimenting is basically run it, didn't work, swear, tweak it, run it again, swear some more. Well, this is fine, but when you're, do when you're building up and tearing down an SSH connection and starting a remote node every time, that starts to get really boring really quickly. Um, it, it, it's, 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 the, it's, the same, it's the same feeling you have trying to run tests for a moose using project on a slow machine. <laughs> um, so, one of the things that I've been really enjoying for experimentation is tiny wrapper, um, which, is ba which is basically a wrapper around eval with lexicals. Now, eval with lexicals is not much different to 
uh, Rocco's lexical persistence module, except for one crucial thing, which is that eval with lexicals is pure Perl, which means I can send it over the wire, because it fat packs, which means I can start attack eval service, and that will slurp the eval code from locally and set it up on the far side, um, at which point I basically run a loop like around like that, using capture timey um, to make sure that if you run something that prints anything, that doesn't um, mess up your control channels, it simply returns it. And then on the local side, create a REPL object, give it the remote side, and by invoking that, that re.pl prompt is an interactive Perl REPL embedded inside the remote Perl process. Um, at which point you can mess around with stuff on the far side um, and only actually turn it into real service code later when you're ready to do, when you've uh, got it working. Um, so um, I managed. I, I thought I'd killed this laptop. Um, and I managed to marinate it in half a bottle of Fanta on the way back from the Perl workshop. Uh, fortunately, it's a ThinkPad. So after two weeks of drying out time. Um, I, 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 was, I was about to, to dismantle it and take the drive out and rescue the data that way. Um, and then couldn't, find, couldn't remember where we put the screwdrivers in the office and went, you know what, it's not going to hurt anything. Hit the power button and it booted. It's like, I think I have an undead laptop. Not complaining. Good toy. Anyway. Um, I've created a channel on Freenode as hash pull tap. The reason for it being on Freenode is because I want to encourage people who aren't specifically Perl community who are just, I am a sysadmin who wants to get some stuff to run on a bunch of machines um, to use this. Um, hash pull hyphen puts it in the Perl namespace and since I'm the um, Freenode group contact uh, that, that's within the area that I'm already managing, so we don't need to go through any of the um, project registration stuff. Um, which, while well, Freenode, we, we have managed to get um, group contact registration stuff much faster on Freenode now. Um, it's still a fairly heavily loaded process because there's only so many volunteers, so it, it just seems simpler to stick pull hyphen on the front and bypass that. Um, and I, I, I apologise for it being horribly underdocumented so far. But I was planning to ride most of the docks on the train back from London Pearl Workshop. Um, and obviously I spent that train journey going, oh, I think I've killed my laptop instead of doing anything. Um, and so the, the, the original thing was the first thing Tack did, he wrote himself. The second thing Tack did, he wrote the laws. The third thing Tack did, he wrote the world. And I don't know what sort of world we're going to want to write with this. Um, oddly, the first um, service I put into production using TAC isn't using any of the SSH stuff. Um, I've just used it as a convenient way to have a daemon that has um, three different um, ways of addressing it. Um, a Unix socket that a local process uses to populate it and a TCP one that remote things use to query and, ta and TAC makes it easy for me to um, only exposed to those things, the, th the um, parts that they need. Um, so, all I can really say is, have a look, have a play. I think there's sufficient tools here to do a lot of very cool things. But I'm not entirely sure what we're going to want to do with it. So, have an experiment, hop onto the IRC channel and shout at me when you break it. And we'll see where we get. Thank you very much. Since Jamie hasn't come in and shouted at me yet, I conclude that means that we do have time for questions if anybody wants to ask anything. It seems really, yeah. this seems really useful, especially for distributed testing. Like uh, I hack on this jitterbug thing, it doesn't know how to distribute out to all these machines to, to do testing, and this tap looks like it would be really useful. Yeah, it's, if, if you're going to be repeatedly doing exactly the same thing on remote machines, um, there's probably lots of ways of doing it that work. 
Um, I mean, the, the, the key point for this is the idea of I am going to write something in a TAC file that I'm going to run three or four times and then may never need again. So I don't want to go to the trouble of doing all of the... Um, I think it should be possible to make it cache stuff that's been sent locally if you want it to. But I don't want to have the core code assume that it has write access anywhere. Um, because that would be one extra thing to configure. And part of the point here is that a, lot, you know, a, a module that you're sending across for a particular task may never be needed on that machine again if it's a one-off task. So that, that's, that's not a default, but it, it's certainly fairly trivial to implement. I mean, you know, literally the ink hook thing could just write it to disk before it returns the file handle. It's, um, I'm, I'm sort of... For, for, for seeing this as being um, something that will get used a lot in environments that don't have centralised control yet, um, where, you're, where you're, you're in a situation of, my environment is what it is, I want to be able to do a bunch of stuff, um, and not have to worry about getting permission to install things and configure things. This is the point of all I need is something I can SSH to and a copy of Perl probably 585 on the far end. Um, I'm pretty sure 581 will work if you don't care about Unicode. Um, it, it has been my experience that if you do care about Unicode, then anything less than 585 is just going to cause you agony. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm intending to keep that compatibility level for as long as possible. Because while I'd love to be able to use the shinier tools in newer pearls, um, any any sort of environment that's disorganised enough that this is going to be at its best utility probably ca contains at least one Red Hat box. So you're not going to get a Slurs box. Sorry? Or a Slurs box. Or a Slurs box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not porting it back to 5.6. <laughs> they have 5.8.5. That'll do them. I assume that you got to put your keys out there to... Currently, it expects to be able to get, to get through the key. Um, I don't see that there's a problem with That's making it possible to supply a password. Wouldn't um, SSH just prompt for it on student anyway? I think it, prob it probably will, but if you're SSHing into six hosts, then, th then typing yeah. the password six times is probably quite annoying. The way Fab handles this is to trap it, read the password from you, keep it in memory, and keep resending it. But that, that kind of scares me. <laughs> That's uh, what SSH agent is for. Yeah. Right, but then you need to have the key installed. Um, I, what I quite like is to have a setup where um, if you log into a machine, um, it can invoke SSH copy ID for you. Um, I mean, t to be entirely honest, what, what, what I'm probably going to do, because um, there, there's a customer platform that I'm going to be using this on that, where, that doesn't have my key installed most places. Um, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to get um, a later version of TAC will ship with a command where you say, here's a set of hosts, you're going to prompt me for the password once, and then the first thing you do using TAC is install the flipping key on all of them. <laughs> Um, at which point, yes, you've had to keep the password in memory for the period when you've installed the keys, but that's it. Which I, I, I think is a much sort of, much less scary. <laughs> it's a reasonable um, But I, the, 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 the key point here was, was to have a substrate on which all of these things could reasonably easily be built. And then I figure we'll build a bunch of them um, play around, and one of, the, one of the key things here is that because um, a command in a in a TAC file is just one subroutine, um, we can share things around in a, in a lightweight way, literally just by going, "Here's a command I just wrote. I'll stick it on a on a paste bot for you. Have a look, fiddle with it, see if that works." Because the, 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 for for ad hoc system scripting, needing to go to the point of creating a module and a CPAN distribution just to share a a, a command with somebody else seem like overkill, um, and it is a whole lot of stuff that's going to be a barrier. So I'm, I'm, I'm honestly quite comfortable with the idea um, that a fair amount of the sharing will just be by people copying and pasting around from, and maybe you know, 
including their ta including a, a TAC file in their dot files repository on GitHub, which seems to be a popular thing. And, uh, we'll, we'll see where we go. I mean, I, 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 I've been playing around with this for a couple of months now, but I still think we're at the stage where we haven't had this tool available in, the, in, an, in an easy to use way for long enough to know what the best way of using it is. Um, so uh, please, 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 please bear in mind that at this point all, all, all I'm really sure of is it works and it's really quite fun to use. Um, how, how it's going to evolve is probably going to largely depend on um, sort of the, the next dozen external users I get um, telling me what they want. Um, we'll see. Right. They seem to have stopped. There's probably something else going on. Um, yes. I'm waffling, so I'm going to shut up.